having me. Um, so I'm going to be talking about quantum linear algebra over the course of the week. Um, still haven't like totally pinned down what I'm going to talk about, but um, it'll be around that area. Um, and I'll basically be following the lecture notes, which I just checked the they're on like the PC of my website now, or I think I put them on my website just now. So, um, okay, but for the first lecture, I'm going to be talking about this, um, for the first, I think maybe a few lectures, I'm going to be talking about quantum singular value transformation. Um, and this is a framework for doing quantum linear algebra, and it's uh, been useful for sort of, it's a, it's a useful tool for uh, quantum algorithms in general because it's proven to be useful in a variety of settings. Um, and by the way, feel free at any time to ask questions if, um, if you have any. Um, and the motivation for um, quantum singular value transformation, or QSVT, it comes from Hamiltonian simulation. Um, so here the problem is that we have some Hamiltonian, which um, is a matrix, but in particular it's um, a linear combination of um, some terms, EAs. And then what we'll use about these terms is that they are um, products of Pauli matrices. So um, I guess in particular we can say that they're like um, P1 tensor through Pn, where these are Pauli matrices. Um, and the, so, so it's uh, some object, but you can sort of specify it um, with a sort of small number of, it has like a small description. And so the sort of reason why you might study these things is that they appear commonly in physics. Um, you can imagine, for example, you have these like, um, when people are studying many body systems, um, there are settings where you have these, uh, for example, if you look at like the easing model, which is uh, what people study when they want to understand many body systems, you can imagine like I have a bunch of qubits and I put a qubit on each site. And then I have some like local interaction terms between the sites. And then for example, um, one such term could be a term that, that uh, is the identity on some of the qubits. And then um, it has some interaction term between like adjacent qubits. And so a linear combination of these is going to be um, sort of the um, interactions that govern the system. Um, and the goal of our Hamiltonian simulation um, problem is to implement e to the IHT for some, for some t. And so we're going to, this is uh, e to the IHT, you might recognize from like a Schrodinger uh, equation, we want to evolve a quantum system with respect to these, um, with respect to the dynamics sort of uh, defined by the Hamiltonian. Um, now, early algorithms for this basically proceeded by using this uh, Trotter approximation. So what this is, is it's basically that if you take your Hamiltonian, you can sort of approximate it by uh, an evolution of individual terms, so you can um, evolve with respect to E1 for some small time, and then E2 with some small time, and so on. And the idea is that this approximation works when C is large. And so you could just take C large enough that this is a good approximation, and then all of these terms, well, they're Pauli matrices, and so um, they're sort of easier to implement, and then you can use this to to uh, perform the, the unitary that you want to perform. Um, the issue with this is, is sort of that there's some inherent limitations if you just try to apply this directly. Um, so I'm not an expert in, in Trotter uh, approximations or anything, but I think like naively if you try to do this, then um, sort of th the value that you need C to be, so if you want to get like an epsilon approximation, 
then you might need C to be, you know, naively as large as like poly one over epsilon. And if you try to apply this, then you're, you're going to like ruin your gate complexity. Um, so over the course of like, um, there's a bunch of works on this that eventually got like the optimal time complexity. And the approach ended up being uh, this QSVT that I mentioned before. And um, so I'm going to explain sort of the sketch of like how you can do this with QSVT. And um, okay, so it'll it'll basically proceed by defining something called like a block encoding. Um, and you can think of like a block encoding is like some sort of quantum circuit. And this quantum circuit is going to have some properties that are associated with um, the thing it's encoding. And then the second thing that we're going to observe, or like these uh, algorithms observe, is that you can get, um, can implement a block encoding for um, your Hamiltonian H. And then what you can do is you can use some properties of these block encodings to take your block encoding of H and turn it into a block encoding of um, sort of a polynomial of H for H for, for a piece and polynomial. And finally, what you can do is you can um, take this P of H, uh, choose P in the right way such that you can uh, such that P of H is going to approximate E to the I. Is there a minus sign that I missed? Okay, sure. Minus I H T. Okay, so this is like the basic idea. And then this block encoding is something that you can apply to a quantum state. So this is sort of how these things are going to work. And the rest of the lecture is just going to be me sort of explaining this. Um, any questions so far? Okay. Okay, right. So first, I'm going to define this notion of a block encoding. Um, there are a lot of different definitions. This is just going to be the definition I use. Um, so. For a matrix, it doesn't have to be Hermitian or square, it can be rectangular. Um, what we say is that we say that U is a block encoding. Uh, I should write it out. Block encoding. Um, it's a block encoding of A if um, U. Um, is uh, some quantum circuit, so it's uh, I guess it's a unitary. So I should say is some quantum circuit. So here I'm like referring to the unitary here, though, um, such that sort of. Uh, a is in the top left corner of U. So if you wrote U out, then it would basically look like A, and then there's a bunch of other um, entries here that, that don't matter for us. So, um, right, so this is the definition. Um, another way that you might define this is to say that um, uh, B L dagger U B R is equal to A, and here this guy is like the identity, but it's only considering like the first R columns, and this is the same thing, but you're only considering the first C columns of the identity. So I'm I'm just writing the same thing, but I'm doing but I'm sort of writing it more in the linear algebraic um, way. 
And then finally, like, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to assume that everything is like powers of two, so we can write everything in terms of qubits. And then what this is is um, that if you have some that you can index it into your unitary u in this way. And this is also going to be equal to a. OK, and sort of um, this right hand most one has sort of, uh, you can imagine it like operationally. Like I have my quantum state. I add a bunch of, uh, I have a quantum state that's the size of, um, that's the size of C. And then what I can do is I can attach a bunch of qubits and then apply U. And then I measure and I post select on the measurement being zero. So like I start, I add AR many qubits and then I measure AL qubits. And then if the, the measurement is all zeros, then I'm going, then I sort of like I applied A. So that's how you should be thinking of it. Um, right, okay. So there's going to be times where, um, I don't know if I'll get to it, but um, sometimes I'm going to say that things are like Q block encodings, and what this means is that this quantum circuit has Q many gates. So it's like, or O of Q, I guess. So I'm going to maybe include the gate complexity in here too. Okay. Now, um, so I define this block encoding. What is it good for? Um, or what's the point? Well, something that you can observe immediately is that if you have a unitary U, or like a, a quantum circuit, um, so if U is a quantum circuit, then it's a block encoding of itself. Um, yeah, then U is a Q block encoding of U. Okay, just because um, U is in the top left corner of U. And in the same way that um, if you, if your quantum circuit is mapping psi to U times psi, then um, our our block encoding will have the property will have the property that we can convert a copy uh, copies of psi to copies of a times psi. And the thing here is that a doesn't have to be unitary, so it's sort of more general. It sort of generalizes this notion of um, you know like a like a unitary circuit. Yeah. A lemma. Oh, I'm saying a quantum circuit is a block encoding of the, the unitary matrix. Oh, it's like the circuit. Yeah, I'm not saying, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, so there are restrictions on A for, like, only certain kinds of A can be put in a block encoding. Um, one simple thing that you can say is that, um, right, so if, if you have like A in a block encoding, then the spectral norm of A is bounded by one. So you need the spectral norm to be bounded. And um, this is just because, you know, U is, has a spectral norm of one. And so if A is inside of U, if A is a submatrix of U, that means it's a has to be bounded by one in spectral norm. Um, but apart from that, I don't think there's any restrictions. Okay. Um, right, okay, so just to formalize what I was saying before about applying A, um, I am going to say, okay, so if we have U that's a block encoding of A, um, then we can 
So okay, then there's a quantum circuit that takes from um, that goes from a uh, quantum state psi that's like okay, it's the same dimension as a. Um, just take the dimensions to make sure everything matches. To the quantum state corresponding to a times psi. Here I've just normalized it to be norm one. Um, and then this uh, thing will succeed with the uh, probability um, the norm of a psi squared. Okay, and how do you do this? Um, well, the circuit is pretty simple. You just take your, uh, it's basically what I said before, where you take your psi, you add your um, ancilla qubits, and I think that you want this to be the right hand side of this, but okay, it doesn't, doesn't matter too much. And then you apply u, and then you, you measure, and then you post select on this guy being, the, your, the thing that you measure is being all zeros. Okay. Um, as I said before, technically you're like measuring like al many qubits on the at, at the end. I I won't like discuss this. Uh, I'll just pretend everything is square. Um, right. And so the reason why this works is that if you look at what this circuit the output is, the circuit is going to be precisely uh, is going to output precisely this expression here, where here. There's like a psi on the outside. So like, I guess technically it would be tensor psi. And so this will be a times psi. Because I start with psi and then I add a bunch of qubits and I apply u and then I measure and post-select. And the probability that I see the all zeros outcome will be the norm of a times psi. So this is just what the, the quantum circuit says. Um, yeah, it might not be immediate if you haven't seen this before, but um, um, it's just a small computation. And so the thing to note here is that your probability of success is dependent on how big A is. Like, if A was unitary, so it had spectral norm 1, and, all, and U psi always had norm 1, then you always succeed. Um, so you succeed with probability 1 because this norm of U psi is going to be equal to 1. But if A becomes like very small, um, then you're, you're almost like never succeeding. Um, and you're never doing this like linear algebraic operation that presumably you wanted to do with your blocking code. And so the thing to keep in mind is um, here, like um, basically it's like the size of A matters. Um, here and so if a is like What we'll see is that there are various ways to get block encodings and then they're going to be a but rescaled by down by something And then that's going to show up in the runtime later um, And like essentially speaking the scale of a is Like the complexity it sort of becomes the complexity in, of the algorithm Okay Um Right. Okay, so now I've explained sort of the basic thing that you can do with the block encoding. Um, now you might be asking, how do I actually get a block encoding? Yeah, sorry, question? Do we know that it has to be, you, have, you Um, so I don't know much about this. I think, um, like I think generically, if you give me a matrix, I can put it, like provided that it's spectral norm is bounded, I can put it in a block encoding, but this would be some question of like unitary synthesis that I'm not really, Okay. Yeah, okay, that sounds right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
It, what's the norm bounded by? Okay, I I don't see it. I yeah, I don't see it, but I believe you. Okay, I think the thing that I know is like if you have a, you can embed a over for beneath norm of a, but obviously a over spectral norm of a is better. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, that's is that suffice as an answer. <laughs> okay. Um, if you're doing it this way, then you can't do it any better than the matrix you're embedding has a respective norm of one. Right, right. So maybe it doesn't matter what what the vector is, but I think it does matter. I mean, like if you, for example, if you knew that your matrix was going, if you knew that you're going to apply a matrix to something in like the poor condition part, then you could amplify this poor condition piece. Um, but in general, this um, this probability, I think, should be tight. I mean, like, actually, there you can do like a quadratically better. I'm pretty sure, but um, yeah. Okay, was that <laughs> okay? Cool. Um, great. So um, now you might be wondering, how do you get this uh, block encoding? Um, I'm going to uh, present a couple of properties of this block encoding. Um, so uh, I'm calling these like extensibility properties. And there's a couple such properties that I'll talk about, which is that if you have um, a block encodings of A and B, then you can get a block encoding of A times B, assuming like all your dimensions work out. Um, similarly, if you have block encodings of A and B, you can get a block encoding of some convex combination. So here, uh, maybe I'll say C0A plus C1B. Again, if your dimensions of A and B match, match up. Um, and I think, yeah, so the complexity here, so if this is like, a, if these are like, um, here, if these are like Q A, Q B are the complexities of your A and B block encodings, then these guys will be Q A plus Q B as the size of your, as the complexity of your block encodings. Um, and so, oh, I need help. Uh, where's? Chris, do I need a passcode? Uh, it's locked, yeah. Well, it's not showing, so it's fine. I have my finger. I just don't have it always. Oh, I don't have one. Can you just call my password up here? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you. There you go. Great. Okay. Um, right. So using this set, then we can um, actually uh, get a block encoding of. We can we can get a block encoding of. Um, of H since, so returning to our Hamiltonian simulation problem. If we're imagining that we're looking at all of these linear combinations of terms, we can notice that these EAs were poly matrices and so we could, um, 
they are unitaries, and so we can implement them efficiently, or they are unitaries that we can implement efficiently. And so this H is um, some linear combination of, of these EAs, and so we can, use, we, can, we can use this second property iteratively to get a block encoding of some rescaled H. So maybe I'll say H over C. And I think the thing that the value you need C to be is just the, um, I think this is the value you need, you need C to be. Okay. And if you look at Hamiltonian simulation runtime, this, is, this appears in the, the runtime. Um, okay. So, so we've gotten our first part where we have a block encoding of our Hamiltonian. Um, so now I'll give a brief sketches of how you get these, um, how you prove these extensibility properties. So um, first of all, this is multiplication. Um, okay, and the circuit is, I'll just write down the circuit here. Um, so I'm imagining I'm applying it to a state psi. And then I have a bunch of um, I add a bunch of qubits. And so here, u is a block encoding of a, and then v is a block encoding of b. And then what we can do is we can, I think this, okay. What we can do is we can apply u here and then apply v here. Um, so this, this, this goes on. Um, and so this is going to be my block encoding for, I think of the way I wrote it, it's b times a. Um, and the way that you can see that is that there's basically two circuits going on here. There's this u, and there's this application of u, and then there's this bigger application of v. And they correspond to uh, this circuit that I mentioned above, where um, if you sort of select it on the submatrix where everything is zero, all of your um, auxiliary qubits are zero, then you see that from this circuit, since it's just a composition of these two circuits, you get B first and then, or sorry, A first and then B, so it's B times A. Um, does that make sense? Okay, cool. Um, as for addition, or I guess linear combinations, um, this is, the technique that is used is also called LCU, or like the linear combinations of unitaries. This is the same thing. Um, but I'm going to show it for just, um, so this works for like a more general linear combinations. Um, I'm going to show it for two. So what you can do is you can take, um, first of all, something that you can do is like, if your block encodings, if your U and V are different sizes, then you can always pad one with the identity until you get uh, that U and V are the same size. Um, like if U is a block encoding, of A, then identity tensor U is also a block encoding of A. So I'm just gonna um, pad so U and V are the same size. Um, <coughs> and then what I can do is I can attach another qubit and then apply some one qubit unitary that I'm gonna call maybe V dagger. And I'm going to apply um, U and V conditioned on um, this one, this uh, qubit. Okay. And 
this circle here means it's conditioned on the value being zero, and the, the filled in circle means it's con or sorry, it's controlled, I guess, controlled on con controlled on the um, qubit being one. And okay, so why does this give you what you want? You can, if you look at what this guy is, I'm gonna write it in terms of like block matri matrices. So what this is implementing is it's taking, um, so this V is, this controlled V is going to be controlled on the qubit being one, so this is V, and if the qubit is zero, it's performing the identity. I guess these are zeros. And uh, similarly, this U, I'm only applying U if the qubit is one, so if in this, uh, in that event, I'm applying u, and then otherwise I'm applying the identity. And so this is equal to uv. And then what this v dagger v thing is doing is it's, um, is it's saying, okay, v, maybe I shouldn't be using v, I should be using x. Okay. What you can do here is you can then say, okay, what is x? Um, I'm looking at x tends to the identity here, so um, x applied to the first thing, and it's going to be equal to sort of x zero zero. <coughs> right, so going to be this um, dagger times uv so this is what my expression is and I want to see what this is a block encoding of so I'm looking at the top left block here and so the top left block is going to be, if I can do it correctly, it's x0, 0 squared times u plus x, 1, 0 squared times u. So, um, so here I've, um, uh, x is like a unitary, so these two sum to 1, the x0, 0 squared and x1, 0, x1, 0 squared. They sum to 1, so I'm able to get this convex combination of u and v. And because I'm getting a convex combination of u and v, then I'm getting a convex combination of their block encodings. <coughs> and so this allows me to get like linear combinations that are non-negative, and if I want to get more general, then um, what I can do is I can modify these to have, some, to have some phase here. And then this will allow me to get like arbitrary uh, complex combinations as long as their magnitude sum to one. Okay. Any questions about about these? Uh, the block matrix picture. Um, let me see. What what is it going to be? Um, it should be. Like I think it's just um, like I, I think basically what it is is it's just like it, you want to draw like a four by four thing, so it's like a it's like one of these things is going to be um, like um, Let me see if I can do this on the fly. It's going to be um, u, u, and then this guy is going to be like, um, or, yeah, it's a little complicated because you have to like, it's like the dimensions sort of you need to work out. The, they, they don't work out, but okay. Um, yeah. 
this is nice because you you're just attaching an extra qubit, so it's like a yeah, it becomes a two by two block matrix. Okay, um, any other questions? Okay, sweet. Um, now you might imagine, like, what can I do? I just showed you how to get like linear combinations. I just sh showed you how to get like products. And so this means like if I have a block coding of A, um, <coughs> then I can maybe get block encodings of like polynomials of A just by using this tool of like, okay, I get, I can multiply by A. I like add something and I, I multiply by A, so on. And so this sort of works. Um, so I'll define what polynomials of A means because it doesn't maybe quite make sense for non-square uh, matrices. So, okay, just some quick definitions. So if we're looking at an, a matrix A that's Hermitian, Then this means that, okay, we have, we can write it in terms of like its eigen decomposition. So I have my eigenvalues and my eigenvectors. Then we can apply any matrix, uh, any function to that matrix um, by just applying it to the eigenvalues of, of um, a. And so the thing to note here is that if um, um, if S f is a polynomial, um, it like matches. It corresponds to the thing that you get if you apply, if you just plug in u into the polynomial. Um, uh, maybe I should just say like. Like, so if you're applying, like, say, p of x is equal to x squared plus 2x plus 1, then the sort of, then if you plug it in just by saying p of a is equal to a squared plus 2a plus the identity or something, then this is e equivalent to the definition you get when you apply it to the eigenvalues. Um, So, um, what happens when your matrix isn't square or isn't Hermitian? So now we're looking at for A that's potentially um, not Hermitian, then we do have a singular value decomposition of A. And then we can define something called like the singular value transformation um, singular value transformation of, of A, which is that if we have some function and it's odd, then we can apply it to the singular values. And when it's even, we can apply it to the singular values. Um, but the difference is sort of like we look at, we change um, here so that this is a V instead of a, a U. And the reason I'm defining it this way is so that it makes sense with respect to polynomials. So like, um, for example, like if I have uh, P of X is equal to like X cubed plus X, then P of A, the definition that I defined just now, um, maybe I'm gonna add like an SV to denote that this is like a singular value uh, transformation. This is just going to be the same thing as A, A dagger, A plus A, right? And if it's, uh, you're looking at some polynomial X squared plus identity, then this corresponds to like a dagger a plus the identity. So I'm just defining things to make, I'm just defining the singular value transformation to make sense in terms of polynomials. <coughs> um, right. Okay. 
And now, now that I've defined what these polynomials are, we can sort of formalize what we mean by, um, we can just do arbitrary polynomials, um, which is that we say that a degree d polynomial, um, maybe I'll call it p, so you have some polynomial possibly with complex coefficients. <coughs> And we say it's uh, achievable if um, um, if we can some way have some way to map quantum circuits um, such that we can get a block a map a block encoding of a and take it to a block encoding of the singular uh, value transformation like P of A. Um, and so basically it's like, you give me some circuit that gives me my block encoding of A, and then I give you back some circuit that's a, a block encoding of, of uh, P of A. And what the extensibility properties show um, it shows that x, x squared, x cubed, and so on, these are all achievable. <clears throat> um, I guess like you need to specify that this like uh, the new block encoding is like efficient um, in terms of the degree. Um, but the way that but you can see that all of these um, monomials are achievable. So for example, here what we would do is we would we need to implement a dagger a. And what we use is that we have a block encoding of A, and then we also have U dagger, or U inverse, which is a block encoding of A dagger. And then so we can multiply them together. <coughs> and then consequently, we can use our linear combinations trick to get, um, then we can get that a polynomial that's like a linear combination of monomials, like some sum a k x to the k, is achievable, provided that your sum here a k is bounded by one. Okay, so um, <coughs> so here I can just take linear combinations of these x to the k's, and this, this will give me the sum that these are, you can get these from the extensibility properties. Um, moreover, I'm pretty sure this is, this is like sort of all that you can get from these, just chaining these two properties. And the thing to notice is that this is actually not, um, this is not all polynomials. Um, uh, that we could hope for. Um, one example of a polynomial that we could hope to apply um, is this Chebyshev polynomial. <coughs> which I'm going to talk about in a couple of lectures. <coughs> and this Chebyshev polynomial is, is, for example, the thing that you use if you're doing amplitude amplification, like oblivious amplitude amplification. And in particular, if you look at the coefficients, the coefficients are all like greater than one. Um, so you're never going to have this property holding. <coughs> and so you, you do need something more. And there is a, a nice theorem. It's sort of like sort of the fundamental theorem of block encodings. Um, and this theorem basically says that all polynomials are achievable. Like all the, every polynomial that you could hope to be achievable is in fact in achievable. So, so if if you have a polynomial p that's uh, even or odd, and you have that uh, p of x is bounded by 1 for all um, values between minus 1 and 1, <coughs> then p is achievable. Okay. And so 
Um, I this is uh, a theorem that I'm going to probably uh, hopefully prove next time. Um, and okay, so this is basically why is this all you could hope for? Well, if p of x is larger than one, then like what we need we need that uh, a property that we need is that <coughs> if a has spectral norm bounded by one, then p of a also has spectral norm bounded by one. <coughs> and so, um, in order for this criteria to hold, we need that p of x is always between minus one and one whenever x is between minus one and one. <coughs> um, right, because the singular values are always um, between zero and one, and you need this to be mapped to, sp to be something between um, minus one and one. <coughs> and since p is even or odd, restricting to zero, one doesn't really change anything um, in your constraint. <coughs> okay. Um, so hopefully I've like shown you that this is like um, this is a very nice result. Um, <coughs> and then, so finally, I'll, I'll explain to you a little bit about like um, how you use this to get your Hamiltonian simulation algorithm that we were hoping for. So turning back to Hamiltonian simulation, right? We had our block encoding of H, right, which we got from taking linear combinations of my unitaries, my unitaries EA. And then what I want is I want E to the minus I H T. And with Euler's equation, this is uh, like cosine of H T minus I sine of H T, right? And okay. This is pretty nice because um, what we're applying is we're applying cosine of xt to h here. Um, and we're applying sine of xt to h here. And so these are both uh, bounded. So they're both in minus 1, 1. They both map minus 1, 1 to minus 1, 1. Or, um, yeah. And they're uh, odd or even. And so these two properties sort of suggest that what we could do is we could find some polynomials, um, find some polynomials such that uh, c of x is close to cosine of xt. And then similarly, some s of x, some polynomial s, um, that's close to sine of xt. Okay, <coughs> and these polynomials, okay, these polynomials are also, we need them to be bounded and even and odd respectively. Okay, um, and so with this, we can take our block encoding of H and then use our special SVT theorem to get block encodings of um, C, S, V of H, and S, S, V of H. These are, because H is Hermitian, these are, these in fact coincide with C of H and uh, S of H, so it's not a big deal. And then what we can do is we can take linear combinations of these two, and then we get a block encoding of one half C of H minus I S of H. And then the, the thing that you see here is that this is approximately one half E to the I minus I H T. And here this approximation is like epsilon. Okay, actually I think it is, is precisely epsilon with these two bounds here. So you could try to work that out. Okay, so here, I get this block encoding of one half e to the minus i h t, and so you know, using the thing that I said all a long time ago, we have this psi 
And with the psi, we can map it to, we can use our block encoding that we've just constructed to get this one half e to the minus iht psi divided by the spectrum over this guy. I guess um, we get some quantum state basically that's like, <coughs> we get something that's like approximately e to the minus iht psi. And the one half sort of goes comes in like the probabilities, so like the probability of success is like one fourth here or something. So if, if all we wanted to do was produce copies of the state, then we wouldn't need to do anything. But there's also this technique of um, oblivious amplitude amplica amplification that can get this one half up to like one minus epsilon um, with, a, with some additional like overhead. Um, right, so that's how you do it. <clears throat> and um, if you work out the actual complexities here, the complexity of the algorithm um, so the actual cost of the algorithm, I haven't explained to you what this algorithm is yet, but I'll just tell you that this is going to be the cost of like D uses, or maybe I'll say the degree of C plus the degree of S many uses of H. Where C and S are, are you know, polynomial approximations. Um, okay. Um, and if you wanted to figure out, like, so, so this complexity, uh, you can work out what this is, but. It just boils down to how well can you approximate cosine of xt and sine of xt. Um, and this is like the thing that is determines your complexity. And the right answers here are like the, these these values are like I don't know like t plus. It's not exactly this, but it's something like this. Um, it's like log t over epsilon over log e plus log t over epsilon, something like this. Um, it's, uh, th th anyways, this, there's some like right answer here. And this right answer is like the optimal thing that you could expect for, for this Hamiltonian simulation problem, or the optimal, um, optimal complexity in, I believe, all of the parameters um, for, for uh, Hamiltonian simulation. Um, that's a great question. So, um, I think, so I think the lower bound for there's like a lower bound of t because of this um, like no fast forwarding. Um, and then there's like a log one over epsilon over log log one over epsilon. And I think this comes from like this correspondence between discrete and continuous query models or something like this. Um, and I, I don't precisely remember like what the, right combination of these <laughs> these things are. Um, yeah, I can look into it after. Um, but yeah, I think the I think the lower bound of log over log log does not go through polynomial approximation, which is somewhat surprising. Or I mean it's not it doesn't look like polynomial approximation, I guess. Um, but it is in this um, paper of like exponential improvement of um, simulating sparse, sparse Hamiltonians. Is that the Hamiltonian that you're saying? There's a t all by itself? Yes. And then there's a log t over epsilon over the 
this is not the tight, like, it's annoying because this runtime is actually not, uh, in, in different regimes, it's different things. So this is, this is going to be like an upper bound for all of the regimes, but there's a right answer for every, any particular regime where t is like small, t is large, and so on. Um, I, I believe it's like, yeah, in the literature it's called this like R of T epsilon and that's the actual answer. Um, and this is like the Lambert, so it has something to do with like Lambert W functions or something, but yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, that's, that's, a, that's my lecture. Are there any, any questions? Oh, yeah, that's a good clarifying thing. I mean an odd function and an even function, right? So like p of minus x is plus or minus p of x. That's what I mean. Um, yeah, so if you have a Hermitian matrix, then you can consider things that are not odd or even. Um, but we're lo looking at uh, rectangular things, so we only consider those two. Um, any other questions? <laughs>